Good morning, LCR. It's 10 o'clock in Huntington Beach, which means we are gathering for worship. We're so glad that you're with us in the Holy Spirit as we praise God for the work done for us in Christ Jesus. When I get to my sermon later in the service, I'm going to share a few updates on our life together and a few things that we have going on. But we're so glad that we're here and we join our hearts together now in praise. Good morning, church. Psalm 105 says, give thanks to the Lord and proclaim, proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exalt his name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. Remember the wonders he has performed. In our gospel reading today, the disciples were afraid and confused by what they were seeing, probably doubting their own minds as much as they were questioning that it was Jesus. But I think them asking Jesus who he is isn't just his physical identity, but a question of if he is who he says he is, if he will save them from the storm. It's as if they're, they've forgotten in the midst of the storm all that they've come to know of him and all the wonders they've seen him work right in front of them. I know I personally can relate to this. It's hard in the midst of the storm we're in and <clears throat> to stop and remember to trust, to remember the wonders he's done and will continue to do in our lives. But what I do know is what Jesus said to his disciples in the midst of the storm. He is saying to us today, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Come. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he one? is 
altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Let 
Let us pray together. Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, shape us. From long ago, God, you claimed people and you said that they were yours and you opened up the possibility that you could be ours. And so as we walk through this time, whether it's the pandemic time or whether it's the joys of life or the sorrows of life, the happiness or the difficulty, we are yours and you are ours. And so, Holy Spirit, come in this moment of our singing and our reading and our preaching and our sharing in this worship and give us all the gifts that you pour out from heaven. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Today's reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go on your way into the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Juah, son of Nimzai, the king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elijah, son of Sabbath, of Abel, Mahiah, 
as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the Lord of Hazel, jail shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is today's reading. Please stand if you are able for today's gospel. The gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 14. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, and the wind was against them. In the early morning, he came down walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are truly the Son of God. This ends today's gospel. You may be seated. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret about how I measure my time in ministry, uh, and it's because of this shirt. I picked the wrong shirt out this morning, and I measure my time in ministry by how fat my neck gets. So when I started, uh, I was probably 16, then I went to 16 and a half, 17. Uh, and so this is a shirt that would have fit about five years ago, neck-wise, and I don't want to choke myself. So not that you needed that little story, but I thought they should know how I measure my time, not by years, but by the circumference of my neck. I wanted to share a few things about our life together as we get started. Uh, the first is, one of the things I really enjoy about being in a congregation that is so well established and deep is, I know a lot of you have deep and long relationships. Um, and over the time of pandemic, I know many of you have had to celebrate important milestones in birthdays and marriages and other things, but by yourselves. And so as it relates to marriage, I know some of you celebrated 48 years, 52, 54, 56. And yesterday, the Silvas, Jim and Connie, celebrated 50 years. So I just wanted to congratulate them on 50 years of marriage together. Now, the food program that we've been doing since the end of March, 1HB Connects, is officially going to end August 17th. We have just a couple people that were getting connected to services still. And I wanted to thank you for your faithfulness in this. So it was a great partnership with LCR and CCN. We had volunteers calling people. We had folks delivering food. So if you delivered food, if you were one of our young adults, we had a great cadre of young adults. Uh, I just want to say thank you. We're going to end up uh, serving between, or maybe almost up to, uh, 11,000 meals just underneath that. And so the next thing may be coming. Um, we'll let you know. There's a conversation happening this week at the city with a potential new direction that we could head in. And it's just a reminder that God's given us these gifts as we've uh, had to shift gears during the pandemic. But I just want to thank you for your faithfulness from the end of March until the middle of August uh, that has been happening. And then finally, uh, some of the people in our Monday morning Bible study wondered if we could spend some time talking about the faith of our neighbors, you know, other religions, other beliefs. And so I called a couple of our church friends who are friends of LCR, 
and asked if they would do a little presentation plus a Q&A, and they all agreed. Not one person told me no, which I was surprised by. Um, so starting tomorrow, for the next three Mondays at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a special guest on Zoom, and you can click that link that Susan sent out at the end of the week, or you can find that link on our Facebook page. Uh, so the first week's going to be Janine Johnson. Janine is very active in the Huntington Beach Interfaith Council and is part of the Latter-day Saints community, which is a very active community in Huntington Beach. Uh, the second week is Rabbi Steve Einstein, the founding rabbi of B'nai Tzedek in Fountain Valley. Uh, rabbi Einstein will be sharing about Judaism. Uh, and then the third week is Esra Noir, and Esra is a librarian at Chapman uh, University, and she was actually a librarian at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, and Esra will be sharing with us about Islam. So over the next three weeks, uh, LDS, Judaism, Islam will have these conversations. They'll do a presentation and then a time for questions and answers. And if you're interested in that, please join us on Zoom starting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Well, when I was listening to Mike read this morning, I was just so struck by God saying to Elijah, what are you doing here? I mean, what a clarifying question. If God were to sit you down and to ask you that question, what are you doing here? It would be interesting to hear how each of us might answer. Now, the interesting thing is Elijah doesn't really say, apart from the recent facts of his tragic life, he doesn't say, well, God, I've really thought about it, and what I'm doing here is I've decided I really need to find myself. Elijah has experienced a difficult trauma. Elijah has experienced a bunch of violence, and now he's trying to get reconnected to his God to figure out if there's a future. Because just right before the story, Elijah didn't think there was a future, and so actually the prayer Elijah was praying was, I think I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. Just take me, God. There's nothing left for me to do. Everything that I love has been ruined, and so I'm ready for it just to end. And God takes Elijah's prayer that can't imagine a future, and he brings Elijah back to himself, to God, and this will give Elijah a new direction to follow. It's a reminder that this is part of God's work of redemption for each of us. And it goes all the way back to the foundation of our faith, which if you remember, the story of our faith begins in the garden. That's why we have these foundational texts, which is why we have this collection of supernatural wisdom. We can return to these as foundational when everything else seems to be changing, falling apart, not going right. And you can look all around the world whether it's economically, politically, whatever, things are shifting, changing. Things that we used to guide life by aren't there or aren't there the same way. And so we have to return to foundational places to remember who we are. That's what Amy said at the beginning of the service when she said, do we believe Jesus is who he says he is? Do we believe that we are who God says we are because of who God is? So if you remember, it was in the garden, God gave human beings to each other, so we have that dimension of our relationships. We have each other, we love each other, we are connected to each other, but that love only makes sense when it's grounded in a bigger story, which is all of us belong to God, all of us are to walk with God and to experience that love. So even if human relationship gets broken, we still have that love. But that becomes the next chapter is, is out of the garden. People lose sight of God, they don't hear God, they can't connect with God, they wonder if God is real or if God is just an absence. Maybe God is just a human idea that we've compiled out of our need to feel some sort of order in the world. And so now this dis disconnection from God is also manifested in a disconnect with other people. And that's exactly what happened to Elijah when God's saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah is feeling disconnected. And so he literally walks back to another foundational place. He walks from the Holy Land to Mount Sinai, and it's just a couple days. It took the first generation 40 years, but if you go in a straight line, it's just a couple days. He walks to a place where God had appeared and had given the people their identity when he gave them the Ten Commandments and the law and Moses and the whole deal. And you'll remember in the garden, God appears to man and woman and says, where are you? And they were hiding themselves, they were ashamed, they were afraid. And when God appears on Mount Sinai and begins speaking, 
the people are afraid. They want to hide themselves. They say, don't talk. Moses, you go talk to him. We don't want to talk to him. You talk to him. We're too afraid. And now Elijah comes to that same mountain, to that same place, and wonders if there's going to be a connection with God. Elijah, who cannot imagine a future. Elijah, who has been traumatized by the violence of his society. Queen Jezebel, King Ahab, the literal killing of prophets. And so when God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah says, I've been very zealous for you, Lord, but they've killed the prophets and I alone am left. Elijah has the story that he's made sense of recent events and he has the story that he rehearses that he doesn't know how to get out of. Where do I go from here? Each person, each one of us, has taken the details of our lives and we've compiled them into a story that makes sense to us, that we tell ourselves and we sometimes tell other people so that we can make sense of how we go from day to day and we rehearse those stories, but sometimes they're not enough, especially if they're somehow disconnected from God. And so Elijah doesn't ask for anything. He doesn't even really say, God, I'm here because I'm heartbroken and I don't know what to do. Elijah just recounts this story of what's happened to him. I alone am left. And God goes, okay, Elijah, I want you to come outside. And it's this very famous story where there's wind and there's fire and there's all sorts of earthquakes, things are happening. And each time there's this seismic, cataclysmic moment, the Bible says, yeah, but he wasn't in that. God wasn't in that, the wind, the earthquake, the fire. And then it says, and then Elijah heard a sound of sheer silence. Now that almost seems contradictory. Well, how do you hear silence? But it's like if you've ever been in a recording studio and they have all the sound dampening material that absorbs, there's no reverberation, there's no sound, it's like that. Everything is dead, the air is dead, there's no sound, and your body tingles because it's not had the sensation of just a dead space. Now Elijah goes, that must be where God is, in that absence, in that dead space. And it says, he took his mantle and wrapped it around his head. Now, that word of mantle is a famous Bible word, the mantle, uh, and what it really means is a cape. You'll see this in some iconography, literally. I mean, they look almost like superheroes, but they're wearing like capes, and so it was a way to keep warm, and we have it a little bit in liturgical dress today. In fancy places, they wear copes, which are just the mantles, uh, and so he wraps it around his head, and he enters this vacuum. He enters this void, and it's a reminder that in Christian spirituality, over the broad 2,000 years that we've been, there are two main streams of Christian spirituality. One is the stream of Christian spirituality that finds God mediated in things that we can taste, smell, feel, uh, hear. You know, so God is mediated to us through the world that we exist in. So Holy Communion, bread and wine become a mediated space of grace where God appears to us. But there's a whole other stream of Christian spirituality, which is God beyond our senses, so when we can no longer hear, feel, taste, smell, and then God is beyond that. So we can't experience God except to experience the void of God. You'll hear it described as the dark night of the soul. And so that's Elijah. Elijah's in one of those empty moments where God is present, even though it feels like just a big empty space, but that's God's presence. And so Elijah enters that empty space, and God doesn't go, well, now that's better. God simply says again, Elijah, what are you doing here? Sometimes someone just needs to keep asking us the same question, uh, and sometimes that can help clarify our thinking. We go, well, yeah, what am I doing here? Elijah doesn't go, well, no, you know, God, after the wind and the earthquake and the fire and everything, I've been thinking about it, and I realize that I just need some time to myself or something like that. Elijah says the exact same story that he said the first time. God, I've been very zealous for you and the prophets, and I alone am left. Now, the interesting thing that happens next is God doesn't go, you know what, Elijah, boy, this, this did not turn out the way we thought, and uh, I'm going to give you two weeks. I want you to just go spend some time at the beach, you know, ride your bike, get some fresh air, and come back in two weeks and we'll talk. What God has done is God has allowed that same conversation to keep happening, but God is bringing Elijah closer. So the idea is, even if we're stuck rehearsing the same stories that we don't have a direction out of, God brings us closer, God connects that relationship, reconnects and strengthens it, and then you'll notice the next words 
from God to Elijah aren't, Elijah, what are you doing here? The next words are, Elijah, here's what you're going to do next. So if you've been stuck, these moments can be really important where God allows you to puncture through that familiar story and to say, here's what you've done, but here's what you're going to do next. And the key moment is God connects Elijah to his will. Elijah, you've been doing this, and guess what? I have a future for you. This is the thing that every brokenhearted person needs to hear. God has a future for you. God has something for you, and you can connect with it, even after a time of violence, even after a time of breakup, even after a time of things not going well, living in a society where everything is working against you like Elijah. God has this breakthrough moment where now he has a future. Here's what I want you to do, Elijah. You're going to go make Nimshi king of Aram. You're going to go make uh, Jehu king of Israel. And then Elisha is going to be your, uh, your successor prophet. And that's what's going to happen next. And Elijah doesn't go, well, God, can I just tell you one more time? I was very zealous for you. And Elijah now gets this vision that, in fact, there is a future. A future that he could not see, but a future that God had and God revealed by bringing Elijah close, even though it felt like an empty space. And now Elijah goes, I'm on my way. I'm on my way because God wants to connect you to the future he has in store for you, even if you can't see or feel it. This is the powerful moment for people that are no longer living in the garden. The one who walked through the garden wanting to connect with human beings is still doing that. And so God has a plan, and God has a future, and God has desires for us that we can live into. I'm actually thinking as we get into the fall of doing some spiritual spiritual exercise that you can engage in to help you discover, God, what is it you want me to do in this moment or this season of my life? And because Christianity has been around, and we've been in a lot of different cultures and places, we have some fairly reliable spiritual practices that will allow you to engage God through prayer and discover where it is that you can be going next. And that unlocks a whole bunch of potential in your life. Well, the next thing that happens is we can take everything we've said about Elijah and we can put it in light of the gospel story. Now, remember, the gospel story is exactly after what we talked about last week. So where we had been was John the Baptist has been killed. Jesus goes to pray by himself. The crowds show up. The disciples want to dismiss the crowds. Jesus tells them to feed the crowds. Jesus does the feeding of the 5,000, and that's where we're at. And you'll remember, the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus had told him, send all these people away. They're not our problem. We don't have time to deal with it. Which is really funny. They said, we don't have time. I don't have time for this. Jesus, we don't have time. Send them away. And so interestingly enough, in this gospel reading that Mike read, Jesus had time to feed them. They had time to collect all the stuff. Jesus sends the disciples away first. I think that's an interesting detail. Jesus sends the disciples away first, and then he dismisses the crowd, and then he still goes to pray before evening comes. There was plenty of time. It was just that people didn't have the courage of faith to imagine that they could use the time to help other people. I think this is one of the disorienting things about the pandemic, is many people have more time than they've ever had, or at least the time they spent in the car or in certain meetings or whatever, uh, that's all been evaporated. And so one of the excuses we've often used in the spiritual life, if we're honest, of why we haven't done what God wants us to do, is we say, well, we just don't have time. I've got to take the kids to practice, and then I have my this, and then we have that, and then, well, I'll get to the church, you know, and now we do have time. So how does this time become holy time where we can love and care for other people? Whether it's people close to us that we've neglected, maybe it's people in our own family, whether it's people near us or people, our neighbors in need, you know, the hungry seniors we were feeding in 1HP Connects or uh, issues of homelessness or whatever it is that people are dealing with, Jesus sends the disciples away and still has time to dismiss the crowd, and still has time to go to his prayer. Because that's the other thing, is sometimes we will fall out of balance where we will do something, but then we don't have time to pray. You know, that's the thing. Jesus still goes and prays. He still goes and has that alone time with the Father 
because he knows that he needs that for his own spiritual health. And so that's the kind of balance we need to be spike, striking in the spiritual life, which is sort of the activity of faith, even if it's just living out our daily work and practice, and also the retreat to be with the Father in the Spirit so that we can be renewed in Christ. We need that renewal, because sometimes the inner person is starving for renewal, um, and we need to be refreshed. And so Jesus has that period of refreshment, and the disciples are on a new journey. He sends them in the boat, and they're going across the sea, about a five-mile-wide sea. They're going to go across, and the, the Jews had adopted the uh, Roman style of keeping time, so they're going to divide the night into three-hour watches, and so now they're at the last watch of the night that's right before dawn, and the storm comes up. Now, remember, some of the disciples were sailors. They, they were fishermen, and they were very comfortable in a boat. I would imagine some of the other disciples weren't so comfortable. You know, someone like Matthew, the tax collector, I don't think he spent a lot of time in boats before this, and we don't know which disciples were in the boat. Uh, but we can imagine there's probably a little seasickness. There's a little bit of phobia. There, you know, it, the disciples know when to be afraid, like a Peter would know when to be afraid. And then these other ones are probably a little nervous altogether. But by the time the storm really comes up, they're all afraid. And they wonder what's going to happen to them because God appears to have sent them into a storm. God appears to have sent them into this storm, and they're by themselves. And so now they feel very much like Elijah. I've been zealous for you, and now I'm by myself. They feel very much like the people after the garden where they go, well, now we're by ourselves, or we don't know what's going to happen next. Where is God? Now it's almost that story of Elijah with wind and storms and power, but this time God is in the storm, not as a kind of deity of nature, God is the storm God, but now God is a distinct presence in the midst of the storm. They see a face they recognize, and that face is peaceful, and that peaceful face is the face of Jesus coming toward them. And he's so peaceful they assume he's a ghost. The only people who could be that peaceful are dead because they don't have the same concerns of the living. But no, he's a living presence. He's not a shadow. He's not a hologram. He's not being projected with some kind of uh, secret Judean technology, a hologram on the ocean. It is Jesus, the face of peace, coming to them in the storm. He is not the storm, but he's a presence in the storm, and they lock in, and they call out to him, and they want to know if he is who they think he is. All of a sudden, part of God's redemptive work is being able to recognize again the face of God that was lost through sin, through the breaking of the garden, through the expulsion, through, you know, unlike Elijah who has to cover his face and not see and kind of be in an absence, now they get to see God coming toward them. In the first service today, uh, James was playing a psalm that was, it fits so perfectly with this text because it's Psalm 85 that talks about uh, kindness and truth meeting, justice and peace kissing one another. It's a beautiful image from the Psalms. Kindness and truth meeting, justice and peace kissing one another. And the nice thing about this is this idea that if you have truth without kindness, you're going to end up with a kind of dictatorial truth that doesn't care about the people that the truth is supposed to be about. So the truth becomes very hard. We need kindness and truth to meet. But we also need justice and peace to meet you can have a justice that is not peaceful. You know, so you can pursue justice but not have peace, and then you have a whole other set of problems, or a peace without justice isn't really peace. And so the Bible gives us these four virtues together, kindness and truth, justice and peace, and Jesus is bringing all of those to the disciples. He comes to them in kindness. In the midst of the storm, is it possible to be kind? He brings them his justice, but it's coming with peace. He's going to make things right. And Peter's going to try and come to him, which Jesus allows. But what he doesn't realize is Jesus was coming into the boat to bring his peace from the storm. He's going to even take Peter and restore him to the boat and bring his peace. It said the storm was calmed. Now we can imagine, yeah, the storm around them was calmed. The storm within the boat was calmed, probably all the thrashing around and the cussing and everything the disciples were doing. Uh, but even more importantly, I think the storm within them was calmed. I mean, think about this. One of, the, one of the signs of our abundant society is you look around, and most of us have everything we would need, probably more than what we need, except peace of heart. You know, inside us things are churning, and we're anxious, and we're afraid, and we're not sure. And, 
And so imagine Jesus coming in the midst of the storm, Jesus coming into the boat, and bringing a peace that isn't just a calming of nature, but is a calming of us, a calming of our hearts. That might be the silence that Elijah heard now manifested in us. God, bring me peace of heart, the peace that comes with your justice, the truth that comes with your kindness. I want the storm stilled around us as we think about COVID, the pandemic, uh, economic, political, whatever it is, the storm around us, but God, those same gifts, bring them into the heart. Give us peace of heart. There's an ancient phrase in the early church, maybe not the too early church, but it's from our perspective ancient, uh, that said, find peace of heart and thousands around you will find salvation. When the calmness that Jesus brought into the boat is planted into the hearts of Christians, when the calmness of the resurrection is planted in the world of the cross, then other people start to see it and are charmed by it and they say, yeah, that's what's true about life. That's what I've been looking for. That's the thing that I've been hoping for. Maybe now we could ask Jesus the question, what are you doing here? In the same way God asked Elijah, we could ask Jesus, what are you doing here? And Jesus says, I am here to bring you life, to make you fully alive, to give you peace, to live in communion, to restore what was broken on the other side of death. I have come to bring this so that you can love one another and that together you can love me. And as we sing in that song, we are God's and God is ours. Amen. A reminder that in the prayers, if you'd like to offer them, be sure to add those to the chat window. And now we're going to confess together our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayer today, we want to pray for Eric Glicker, who had major surgery this week and is still at uh, UCSD recovering. We want to pray for Don Charlton's brother-in-law who broke his femur and lost a lot of blood uh, during the surgery. Um, I know he has a fever and low blood pressure and breaking your femur can be a fatal break. And so we want to pray for Don's brother-in-law. Also for Maureen Bucky, um, the stroke victim, and also uh, for Mike Yeomans who's in hospice, uh, for Linda and Robert in their prayer, or in their marriage and divorce. Also for the Ludwig family, for Richmond as he leaves for basic. And you'll remember Richmond was going to leave uh, right when everything was going to start and everything got postponed. But now he has the state. And so Richmond will be praying for you as you begin your new calling in the Navy. And we'll remember those young Marines and that Navy corpsman uh, who were in the accident off San Clemente Island this week as well. Let us now offer our prayers to God, trusting that Jesus loves us and loves to hear us and to bring us his peace. God, you know the stories that we tell about ourselves, the stories that we rehearse again and again, the stories that seem to give us some meaning and purpose, but oftentimes can leave out your calling and your will. And so like Elijah, draw us close to you. By drawing us close to you, break open that horizon for a future, a future plan that you have, a future direction that you have, a trust that indeed you are faithful and good and that we can give ourselves to you. We pray for everyone like your disciples who were in that boat, in that storm, for everyone in the storm of the pandemic, for everyone in the storm of the economy, for everyone in the storm uh, in their households, for everyone who's experiencing hardship. Jesus, come to us as that loving presence, that kind truth, that peaceful justice. Come into the boat and bring us your grace and your healing. We want to pray for Eric as he recovers from surgery in San Diego for Don's brother-in-law after the breaking of his femur and for the surgery for his heart and his fever, for Maureen after her stroke, for Mike who's in hospice, and for all those who are in hospice that you might give them mercy and peace as they prepare to meet you in death and may you shepherd them lovingly through that. For Linda and Robert, for their marriage, 
for Richmond as he prepares to leave for basic training for all those who have a calling in our armed forces that you might bless and keep them. We pray for those Marines and Navy corpsmen who died this week off San Clemente and may you bless uh, their families and for the tragedy of their lost youth, we pray. Also for uh, Kingsley Ginelli uh, at Boston's Children's Hospital for testing, we pray for Kingsley as well. God, we know that you hear our prayers and we know that your spirit prays within us offering things that we ourselves don't even know what to pray for. And so may your Holy Spirit soften our hearts that we might be shaped and moved by you and go in the way that you would have us go. And we ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Oh, to the rock and 
since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? It's a wonderful reminder that the song of praise just wells up in us. It's not something foreign to us. We were made to praise God. And sometimes we have those moments, oftentimes in nature or kind of in a loving relationship where you just feel you can't help but praise and sing. For anyone who's ever felt like Elijah searching for God, we now share the sacrament together. And this is one of the visible places where God meets us reliably. So Elijah went to Mount Horeb because he goes, this is where God shows up. And for Christians, this is one of the places that God always shows up. So for the sharing of this bread and wine, the presence of the body and the blood, this is God's promise, I am with you, I will be with you, I will bring my gifts within you. This is literal eating and drinking of the peace of Jesus. We remember how in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And as often as we eat of this bread and as often as we drink of this cup, We proclaim the heart of our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And now we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Nothing can separate us from the love of God revealed in Christ Jesus. So if you have your home communion ready, we'll take the bread and say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And we can say, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus, you are our friend. Hide us in your love. Strengthen us with your body and blood and give the fullness of your grace that keeps us and shapes us and calls us to your future. And we ask this in your name. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us for worship today, and we hope that God blesses your week with the peace that comes in Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh